And we ultimately talk about adequacy of the answers, and I'll tell you more about it in a minute. The freedom that the graphs, again, graphs are not as good as the system also, because, again, there is increased chance of any graph diagnosis, there is a five-fold increase in infection risk, and there's poor long-term patency. After sometimes they might close, they need to change them. And there's also high level of complications and interventions. We need keep to ask the help of the hospital surgeons frequently because of these problems. And again, with, with frequent infection or stenosis or lack of enough blood flow rate, this affects also the quality of dialysis and the adequacy of dialysis. And if you can see, I've been focusing a little bit about the adequacy of dialysis because really it's important. Uh, you might find some patients doing in your center four hours hemodialysis, and the same patient come to me and do four hours. Maybe my four hours are not good. After six months, you may end up this patient in ICU or in emergency room. Whereas the one who's doing four hours in your center is doing very well over many years to come. And the reason for that simply is because the adequacy of dialysis is good. We're doing good four hours dialysis. And the way to measure this adequacy, how good is the dialysis, we always look at KT over B or the adequacy of dialysis. And basically, K over B stands for K for the clearance. And we look by this at the clearance or the uh, removal of small size of liquid waste uh, toxins, endothelial toxins like urea. Uh, and this K stands for clearance of urea, for example, T for the time during the dialysis. And this stands for the volume of the work, patient's total body volume, where the urea is distributed within the system. And by doing this equation, KT over B, we always try to aim, if possible, to achieve something like 1.4 or more of this equation. And I will tell you why we would like to have that. Because if we are having KT over B more than 1.4 or more, you can see the number of hospitalization patients is much less. Whereas if we're talking about cases with less than 1.2, you can see much more hospitalization for these patients. So cases of these methods, and if we look at the survival rate as well, you can see here, if we have 1.4 or more, you can see survival rate is much better, it's the highest. But when we go down below, if you go below 1.2 or even less, the survival rate is lower and lower. So we should always aim at higher KTO over B in order to achieve good survival <coughs> and less hospitalization. As you can see here, on the y-axis, it shows the percentage of patients with KTO over B less than 1.2. Okay, and this is the hospitalized. And you can see patients with catheters, more than almost 28% of them here in this study, showing that they have KTO over B less than 1.2. Whereas with fistula, much lower than that, 19%. And if we look at, again, here, the hospitalization rate, you can see patients with catheters, they are more prone to hospitalization than patients with a graft, than patients with fistula. So I wouldn't love really to have catheters. And if we look at the causes of admission to hospital, what are the causes of hospitalization? And when you talk about causes of cardiovascular disease, infection, the problems of vascular access itself, or GI bleeding, or others, you can see the yellow bars here, always associated with, more, with the capitals, really, more than the grafts or the fistula. So whenever there is a capital, there's more fitness of complications, any one of those ones, which may lead to <coughs> hospitalization, more hospitalization. And what about talking about mortality? Not only about mortality, the increased risk of death. Again, you can see patients with capital are more prone to die than patients with grafts what about the cost? Even the cost is higher. This is comparing the capital and the graph and the fistula. And see on the y-axis the cost in dollars. And this is the first year of the creation of the muscular axis. And as you can see, the first year is cost about eight seven thousand dollars Whereas the graph, 76 lower. And fistula much lower, $68,000, the cost of looking after this uh, access. Even if you look at the second year of the course, although the course is lower in the second year, it's still capital costing more money to look after than the ground or the computer. So from these quick really slides and studies, you can tell easily that
that there is no, no wonder that the calculating restriction gives us better capability, there is less risk of infection, less hospitalization, less mortality rate, and lower cost. So why, why should we always go to a petitioner and forget about the capitals? And if we go back a little bit few years back in the beginning of in this century, about 2002 here, in this paper, which was the first paper published, or the earliest, if you like, paper published by the DOPS group, or DOPS studies. Uh, I don't know if you are aware about the DOPS, but DOPS is test for uh, dialysis outcomes, practice patterns study. This is established in the United States in 1996 to look at the practice patterns, how the people doing dialysis in different countries. They started in the United States, then they looked at Europe, they moved to Japan, and more recently, we conducted with them, collaborated the study in Saudi Arabia, a pilot study, and I'll show some of the results later. Amazing, it tells you what we are doing, what we are doing good or doing bad, how much the standard schedule will be, how much vascular access we have, and then we compare that with other countries. So when they started, they started their current system in the United States, see how much they do in vascular access, and they compared that with Europe. And they were really surprised. It was like a shock. Because look here, this is comparing the prevalent patients. Prevalent means patients who are on dialysis for longer time. Incident patients who are new, who are going to start dialysis now. So in prevalent patients, they noticed that only 24% of their patients actually have having fistula. Whereas when they compare that with Europe, look, in, in Europe, almost an average 80, in France 77%, Germany 84, in Italy 90%, Spain 82, even, even in the UK at that time was 67, higher than them. So they were really surprised, they have very low level of uh, vascular access for in the form of arteriovenous vascular. When they also look compare their incident patients, you want to starting dialysis, again the fistula was only 15%. Very low, they were way behind also Europe when they were talking about 60s and 70s or maybe 80s and the percentage. And that prompted the United States to say, look, we have to stop here, we should promote arterial venous fistula because we have so much trouble of hospitalization, mortality, and costs of this fistula. So what they've done in 2003, after looking at DOPS study, said, okay, we have to, to aim at reach our patient to 40%. They worked hard over in our team, all over the USA, and in 2005 they achieved the 40% the target. So they said, well, that's not good enough. We should raise our bar to reach 66%, something similar to what Europe at that time was trying to achieve all over the Europe, 66%. So they did work really hard. So until January of this year, 2012, they achieved 60%. Six, they haven't reached really the target, which is 66%. In June, I'll show you, I'll show you in a minute a slide, they reached 62 in June recently. It seems they're working out there. However, having said that, looking at the incident patient, they set the target, they're dying about 50%. But so far, at the beginning of this year, again, they only achieved 20%, which was still very difficult to achieve um, the fistula. And I think the reason for that is maybe the the disfragmentation really, of the pre-dialysis scale, which I know there is a lecture about it in this meeting. The value and the importance of the pre-dialysis scale is very important because you see the patient early on, you prepare the patient, when they reach any stage in a failure, before ending, you start to educate the patient, introduce the patient to vascular access, or maybe peritoneal dialysis, maybe you set the pick of catheter in the first place, or maybe the patient will he or the doctor decides to go for uh, hemodialysis, then maybe you can establish the fistula first. So when the patient in need of dialysis, you don't rush in the emergency room to insert internal jugular catheter or femoral catheter. The fistula already is there, established, mature, you can start by using it, and then you avoid complications with those incident patients. But I think that's the reason, because of pre-dialysis care maybe is this right. And this is the recent DOPS study, and this is what we've done also with DOPS in the United States. Uh, uh, I'll show you that with our results. But this is in June. This is June 2012. You can see here 62% they achieved, uh, and the chemical went down to 20%. This is graph 18%. And maybe it's summarized more clearly in this slide. You can see they achieved now networks of the USA on average. 62% able to stay down, which is a great improvement, if you remember, from 24% uh, up to 62%, getting it down to 20% in graph 18, 
that's the plan. They are the progressing very nice. Um, uh, and this is showing you what those really we've done in Saudi Arabia. Data. We've just finished the data, actually, the results. This is Saudi Arabia here. And our study, what we have done, really, we achieved now something like 73% all over Saudi Arabia of the fistula, arterial fistula. Little bit of drugs and little bit still of chemicals, as you can see there. So if you look at Saudi Arabia, for example, we are better than Spain, United States, Belgium, Sweden, and, and, and Canada. But it's still, we're close to the United Kingdom, but still less than Italy, um, Australia, New Zealand, Greece, and France, I'm sorry, Germany and France. The best so far is uh, Japan. Japanese, they are reaching more than 90, almost 93% of their patients with arterial venous fistula. It's very small. Again, I showed you this a while ago, but I was going to talk to you or show you our little experience, how we were trying to improve in our area, in Eastern Provincia, and in particular in the Mount, our Cantonese Center, improve the level of arterial venous fistula use and avoid, if possible, as much as we can, the, uh, the chemicals. Again, um, this chemical center, which I mentioned earlier, um, uh, it's within uh, a big hospital. They call it the Man Medical Complex. It used to be called the Man Central Hospital, but because it's expanding with so many centers, cardiology center, kidney center, dental center, radiology center, uh, infectious disease center, name it. All these centers become more centers rather than one only big building, plus the tower which contains all medicine and surgery. So they call it medical complex, and I think within a very short time the, the name will be changed into a medical city, maybe the man medical city. Uh, this center, in fact, is the main referral center for all the eastern province region, in all the east part of Saudi Arabia. All the referral systems. Here. Although there are other units and centers in the area, but this is considered to be a referral center. And therefore, you don't see this, no wonder that we are having about 80, now we are having more than that, 80 modern modern machines. We perform dialysis for more than 400 patients at the moment. And there are about 5 to 10 new patients weekly requiring initiation of dialysis. Mm -hmm. We can see it's quite a busy center. All the time we're having new patients. And just give you a flavor of what we used to be and what now the situation. Um, this is the time when I joined the hospital as an old man can tell. This is from 1982. We used to have, I think, 4 or 6 patients when we started the dialysis. And you can see the progressive increase in number of patients over the years. Until now, we can see we have now over 400 patients. And look, with this increase and new patients every week, there is definitely increased demand for hospital access. We cannot treat all those patients out of the cabinet. There must be a plan. There must be uh, something to be done for these patients. Now, mind you, this is only in Kansas Center, only in our center. But if you look among all the eastern province region, this is in 2001. We have something like 800 patients on dialysis and all over the area, all hemodialysis used in all over the area. And look, in 2004, just 10, 11 years more, we have doubled the number of patients, 1,600 patients currently on hemodialysis. And look, there is continuous demand for vascular So you need really a team, proper team to look after that. This is what we used to do, unfortunately, before. This is our situation. We use now more than 70 or 70 or 75 percent of our patients at care center with catheters, unfortunately, I would say. And, and we have only that 25 or maximum 30 patients with arterial venous Ask me, were we suffering? Yes, we were suffering a lot. We used to have no diagnosis and it was most of the patients 0 0.8, 0 0.7, 0 0.9, much below than what we should do. And increase infection rate, namely so much infection, admission to hospital, cause antibiotics, everything, sometimes you remove the catheter and find difficulty in the set, another one. Increase hospitalization and again too much cause and occupancy, bed occupancy rate is high. So we decided to do something. We said, well, this is not good enough. We should do something. How can we improve the situation? So the aim was for Kennedy Center and also the areas all hemodialysis centers in Eastern Province was to enhance collaboration with that established and enthusiastic vascular surgeon. We need to we used to have a vascular surgeon, but he has he had priorities. He goes for our take for uh, other vascular surgeon uh, operations and leave at the bottom of his list our need of fistula. So we always end up at the end of surgery, either he doesn't have enough time or he will finish quickly and do some cancer. 
So we never had enough experience to do that. So we thought maybe we can see somebody from other areas to can help us and collaborate with them and do the vascular surgery for us. The aim was obviously to avoid or reduce capital and safety rates, increase arterial vascular rate, improve the quality of hemodialysis, and decrease morbidity and hospitalization rates as much as possible. So what we do, uh, the vascular access program, we call a program for collaboration, started in July 2008, so you can almost say two years ago. The program was shifted from admission, we used to admit patients initially to hospital. We shifted to day surgery, so patients come in the morning um, under local anesthesia or even general anesthesia and be discharged in the afternoon. So there's no bed occupancy rate high, minimize it as much as possible. That was established in January 2011 with encouraging the team and all the support were given. Initially, the visits of this vascular surgeon who used to come to us from Ria used to come uh, every two months, once. And then, um, uh, with the good results we had and his enthusiasm and the increasing number of patients said, Look, can you make it every month? He said, yes, I'll try. And then he started to come on a monthly basis from December 2011. So almost, you could say, from the end of last year. So all of our patients undergo echocardiogram in our center. We have an echocardiologist in our center with a state of art in an echocardiogram machine to evaluate patients. Patients requiring general anesthesia under the full evaluation by the anesthesia team. Some patients have done Doppler ultrasound of the upper limbs and neck vessels, just to ensure that everything was okay. And then some patients require CT or NGO or neck vessels and secure the cable. The evaluations and investigations for all patients were done in our center and hemodialysis was performed one day prior to surgery, just to make sure are ready for surgery and in good state of general status. Uh, the coordination that was in our center. Now, at the regional level for the Eastern Province region, we received patients from other centers of our region one day before operation. Clinical evaluation, investigations, and consultations, if required, were done through uh, our outpatient department. And the analysis sessions were arranged one day as well before uh, surgery at our center. So, those patients coming from our area, we used to analyze them one day before and just to make them also ready. On the day surgery, trained and well experienced and very cooperative day surgery team of our hospital started their work one day before the procedure. What they've done? Completion of files and review of all the investigations were done one day before the procedure. Uh, patients were received in the reception area, the day of surgery, the reception area yeah, of the surgical unit. Clinical assessment and review again of the investigations were rechecked by our staff. <coughs> Intravenous success and other pre-operative preparations were uh, done by nursing staff as the patient was sent to operating room once more. Again, post-operative was the surgery done. Post-operative patient was received back in the reception area and managed by there by our staff. The our staff, I mean the canopy center, not the hospital one. Within a period of three to four hours, patients were ready to be discharged home after appropriate evaluation and assessment. So quickly within the same day. So what have we achieved? Let's look at these results. Uh, over two years, you could say, we had 16 visits from this vascular surgeon and the team. And on each visit here, you can show on the y-axis the number of procedures that were done on each day. So you can see from visit one, he did 33 operations or procedures. Visit 2, 31, 22, 33, and so on. And you can see, for example, on visit 5, we've done 51, which was excellent, really great achievement. The reason for that, because he did it over two days. He said usually he comes and stays for one day. On that visit, we had two days. So we achieved more. Some even more, like here, 23, and some of them more, because although within the same day, but they started early, very early in the morning, and they stayed in late hours in the evening to manage more patients, so we have more patients and if he cannot do, stay another night. And for over those 16 visits, we managed to do between fistula graft and catheters, 377 uh, patients, that was excellent, I think, number. And from Canopy Center, our center, there were 321 patients, and from the region, other nearby hemodialysis units, we achieved 56 patients, which was based on to other centers surrounding by. This is showing you what we've been We are almost at like 291 arterial venous fistula from 377. 
Sunday night to almost 300 festivals, 45 crowds, third of capital 24, and some other cities they might be moving to crowds or a new rectory, a new residence or migration, or a very small number of procedures that need to be done. And why do the capitals that were that one may ask why you do capitals if you are trying to avoid capitals? Some patients of those ones who are planning uh, uh, soon any transplantation, they would like to go for transplantation, or some patients who refused to have an access, we were forced to insert a catheter. But my view, the, the catheter which was inserted by the surgeon, by the vascular, was much better, or those who were much better than what we did. The outshoot result reduced very much the infection, the clotting, even the type of the catheter that was used, much better than what we used to have, because he advised us on a better type of catheter. And one way some people look at it, like in the States, how to assess really the, the success of whether this specific can be used. Following the operation, four to six weeks, there should be an ultrasound to be done to check the, 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 the specific which was created. If the diameter is of four millimeter or more, and if the blood flow rate is of 500 millimeter per minute or more, then we indicate in most cases, more than 90% that this specific is very likely to be used for hemodialysis and in And from the total number of patients, we achieved from this slide more than 90 percent success rate of the fistula that has been done, with a small percentage, about 7 percent failure rate of some of the fistula. And major of those ones, they were either this was become too deep down that you have to raise it up a little bit, or there were some abnormal vessels or accessories, but this is I'm sure the last one said it, we can ask more about it. But I'll show you this slide, is if you'd like to focus with me on this slide to show really what's really happened. You can see the value of the teamwork when they work together, the achievement. Uh, as you can see on the on the x-axis, the number of the year, we started the year 2006 and 2007, 8, 9, 10, 11, and 12. From 2006 to 2009, 6 to 9, this is before our um, uh, program established. You can see in the yellow line, this is the total number of patients. In the blue one is the arteriovenous uh, fistula aircraft together, and the pink one is the catheters. Okay? And you can see from 2006 to 2009, though the number of patients are increasing, yet the fistula aircraft almost remain the same. There is increase, but minor, is it not much? But look at the capital, the capital was also was exceeding, increasing over the years. Once this program started in 2010, look, the number of patients is increasing. Fine. But look at the fistula graph, progressive improvement in the fistula graph, and look at the catheters going down. Something we will well hope that was our aim really to reduce the catheter use and improve the fistula and for us to expect the fistula graph to be to prevail in the center. And this is to show you really what we have achieved from some of these results. You can see this is before 2006, as I told you, we have something like 25% for patients who are having fistula. <coughs> 35% improved between 2006 and 2009, but following the program there was a great increase up to 78%. That's what we achieved now in our center, 78 or 80%, or even better than the average of the whole Saudi Arabia, as I told you, 73%. If we look at the catheters, we achieved the aim really almost by dropping down from 65% down to 18% now. We have a total of conditions of the catheter. And this is the previous done slide really now, even with the decent visits, we have a better rate lower than that, I think below 15% we have a chemical. And if you look at the, uh, the, the infection rate, the significant very improvement from 6.6% down to 0.6%, great improvement. Uh, and what this was, I wish it was that actually in a minute, and this is showing you the protein even, down from 5.1 to 1%. We used to use a lot of your kinase or um, and, um, uh, plus uh, gene activator really to declot or remove or dissolve those clots really which are from the decade. It's a big headache and cause the game. But that was fortunately very much reduced the clotting. Blood flow rate, which is very important for adequacy of dialysis, to achieve good cash over the improved from one average 200 to 300 miles per minute. Again, can you over the improved from 0.88 up to almost 1.3, which is great improvement really in the body. Hemoglobin has also improved because of adequacy also of theirs from almost an average 9 to almost 11 grams per decilitre. 
And here you can see even this propoidine dose was reduced from 75% down to 60.7%. And I think this is due to adequacy of the asbestos and decrease of the infection, which you know infection really resists the effect of the propoidine dose, one of the reasons. Even serum or nutritional status of those patients have pulled from average 3.2 to 3.7 uh, gram per deciliter of uh, serum albumin. And look at hospitalization, I told you, with less infection, less clotting, loss of this problem. Even transmission also reduced from 6.1 down to 3.8 percent. So in conclusion, as you have seen, really, arteriovenous distillation always comes first. Avoiding temporary catheters and or permanent catheters increases blood flow rate, improves, improves adequacy of dialysis, there is significant reduction in infection rate, and this is also an experienced and interested, I must say, interested vascular surgeon and motivated teamwork, really. Very essential, very important for uh, the success of such uh, a program. And in patients who are not suitable for creation of arteriovenous fistula or graft assessment, a better quality talent capitals incented by experts may give rise to a better blood flow rate, a less infection rate, and less blocking even. And this surgery demonstrates, management demonstrates the safety, friendly, and probably more cost-effective way of care of those patients. So you don't need really to admit patients to hospitals to do that. And my conclusion to you is always think fisted at the surgical conference. Thank you very much. <laughs> Because I see many patients uh, nowadays in our locality 
even the oldest plant analysis point presented to us with high potential. And you know, this is why one of the main cornerstone for evaluation for the patient to do whatever activity is best or cystic health. Not only looking for the, the pain, but I look for the blood pressure, because it is, it is the main cornerstone. If it's still high potential, how to be with how to improve the blood pressure to shift him from the center bed and the caster to the pistol. Uh, so I, I need your experience at this point. Uh, I, I must say, I haven't seen much or many patients with patients before, except for those patients who are prevalent patients, who are on their visit beforehand. Uh, new patients, unlikely, sometimes they are, in fact, hypertensive. But for patients who are already on their visit beforehand, prevalent patients, some of them you might be right, there are some of them, maybe they are having hypertension or on the hypertension side. And I think major, the major reason or uh, cause of that, I think, is because we are uh, over uh, telegrammizing them, maybe, or we move too much towards from them in trying to achieve a good target dry weight. And I've seen few patients, even lately, our staff are over enthusiastic with removing fluids. Uh, and I think a better assessment of the dry weight is very, very important in these patients. Uh, uh, if we remove too much fluid from these patients, they will be, as soon as they start the answer, they will be the good hypertension and sick out and frequent hypertension and resource during the answers. Um, so, for example, if the patients are assessed, like say, for example, the dry weight is 70 kilograms, assessed whether by bio regions or by clinically or by any other means, then with that 70, then we should maintain 70. We shouldn't try to aim at the using down to 68 or 67, because that tends to keep the patient in on hypertension. That's one thing. The other thing, the other reason, some of the patients are following their control of their body volume fluids by the frequent analysis and removing fluids and trying to achieve the drive, which maybe has already been achieved, is the problem is that some patients may still want their antihypertensive medication. And for some reason, we forget our staff or self, forget that those patients are still taking their medication. We should discontinue this antihypertensive medication because we prescribe those medications when they were on the hypertensive side. Now, following the analysis and removing all those fluids and achieving it right away, thank you very much. We should stop this antihypertensive medication. Otherwise, patients would also continue on having hypertensive episodes. So, maybe a re evaluation, I would say, a re evaluation of the patient. And also make sure that cardiac statements are also okay. That the patients are having having cardiac disease or maybe uh, sometimes of those maybe patients who are so dark and maybe not dialyzed well, maybe twice a week or they are not uh, compliant with the life with their so you describe it three times per week, every time four hours they come, they finish two hours, and thank you very much for leaving. Or they come twice per week, and they don't show up on the third person and good time they might develop precardial diffusion and they may affect even the cardiac output and those patients don't end up with very high intensity episode. So what I would say for those patients with hypertension, I will really evaluate these patients again and see what is the likely cause. But probably I will focus initially on uh, the dry weight make sure that the dry weight is achieved properly as they are not on the very dry weight if you like and then check the air and the Very good. Uh, just two points. Uh, as you said, most of the points you covered, but we have not forget about projection of acidosis. Uh, most of these patients are acidotic, uh, so projection of blood pressure will be difficult in the presence of metabolic acidosis. So uh, we have to take attention for acidosis by giving sugar by that. Also, sometimes if you correct anemia, you can support blood pressure. Uh, so, uh, uh, PISA therapy will correct anemia and will support the cardiovascular system. Uh, and number three, as you said, look for pericardial fusion to be approached and supporting the myocardium as well, uh, especially if there is a skin problem. Uh, also, uh, very important, I can accept uh, some overload. Uh, uh, to keep uh, uh, good blood pressure. Uh, no need to make the patient very dry uh, in the face of the So, uh, acidosis, anemia, uh, 
confusion, support in my bargain, and uh, this approval. And besides, of course, during this uh, uh, hypertensive period, I can get an anti-pleated, uh, anti-coagulant, uh, then the patient start to gain good blood pressure. Thank you very much. Uh,
not necessary to refer to the surgeon as this specialist. It can solve the problem very easy. Except it can just need someone who to be uh, strong and uh, sensitive he can do this work. The, uh, I would like at this point to ask about the Sukhata from his experience. Uh, uh, I front with many patients with a central venous cluster liable for frequent attack of some body event because uh, with the history of them with the repeated uh, uh, failure of access or some body event this was hyperagable to tell the group clinical or by some level of hyperagable so you recommend in this situation to maintain the patient with the central venous cluster under or anticoagulation so it can decrease the some body event for the central venous cluster <laughs> no, we, we, we are actually honestly, initially we used to use initially a uh, uh, not good quality capital decision. Now we used to face so much frequent problems with the body. And second thing we used to be most of it accepted by our group, ourselves, etc. We are not very good, I must say. And certainly you are much better than us as that's what I said. But uh, sometimes you do it, you like you do biopsies as you train to do that. But we were not very good, the quality of cadetes were not as good as well. But more recently, especially over the last two years, with our being lucky, very fortunate with this our colleague, the Muslim surgeons, he advised us to use a certain type of cadetes. We used to bring some of them with him. Uh, we thank him for that. And he even said it properly, if you like. And ever since, the number, as you've seen, the number of clotting and infection has very much reduced down with the rate. So we never had the chance to be, even before the earlier time, we never put patients on all that, uh, and she's always going to support that. If there is a clotting, we, we manage that there and then and spot at that time. We never had the chance to be, to consider the patients on all that, and Okay, just a very short uh, question. First, uh, if patients uh, are using CT angio or any study including a dye, we are considering uh, precautions against uh, contrast and use the nephropathy in these patients. Uh, number two, uh, using of calcium carbonate orally can be uh, relied upon to combat against metabolic acidosis uh, instead of uh, sodium bicarb uh, if we are uh, afraid of sodium uh, content, as Professor Rasso suggested. Um, well, um, the, uh, let me start with the second part first, really. Um, calcium carbonate, we don't use it to treat acidosis usually. It's usually we use it to either correct calcium, calcium is low, or I use it as a phosphorus binder because of hyperphosphatemia. But sodium bicarbonate, as Mr. Sosom said also, we use it for patients. I use it more frequently, even patients' free dialysis is later, really. Um, uh, for two reasons. One, to correct acidosis for those patients that are from dialysis. You know, is the only reason to use the sodium bicarb. And second thing, there are studies which have shown definitely when the sodium bicarb can delay the progression of renal disease. Um, uh, this, sorry, the one that's... Uh, precautions to again is the contrast induced in a prophecy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I agree with you totally. I mean, we don't, we try to avoid as much the diet really. It's not because we are trying to take care of the kidney. The kidney is already probably in a stage of in the state of renal failure, we don't care much really, but you don't want to have any systemic fibrosis or any problem maybe because of the dye. So we try to avoid it as much as possible. We either run it without the dye maybe, or maybe most of the time we don't have echo. Our echo rate is brilliant, the machine the resolution is quite high, and we've been very lucky with the echo capabilities we will be having very specialized and really have, as I said, the pros are excellent, the resolution is excellent. We can think of things that we need open without the need of dying. Only small dose of the contrast. If that is really needed, it's really a poor situation. We are, although we try to use those um, types of uh, contrast agents that may not lead to systemic fibrosis, but you never know. Uh, you better be safe now, sorry. Thank you. Professor Kaka, thank you very much for this excellent presentation. I have just a uh, small comment. Uh, the, the main message of the, uh, when I put the program, when we decided to put the plasma access in the beginning of this course, also stressing the point that first to have equal life or the uh, assurance of the plasma access is the, is the most important and critical step in the management of patients in the pre care. And uh, this is a call for the plasma surgeon to put priority, and I want to emphasize that the dominating for the team of decision making is nephrologists. He is a person responsible for the patient. 
and it should depend, as you did in your program, it's very excellent because you depend on a dedicated surgeon who uh, has a very good experience doing the best uh, chance for the patient because fistula uh, means a lot. The second point is uh, the decision to make fistula is not a static decision. So uh, I can say creating for a professor no. There are many factors that uh, we should put in front of our eyes when we uh, take this decision, like the age of the patient, the scope of creatinine or the trajectory of creatinine. So if you have a patient who's creatinine for, for four years, there is no assistance to do but the creatinine is increasing progressively despite all the measures for acidosis, hypertension, etc. The alcantara fistula. Fistula for the young age patients can be done earlier rather than the elder patient. The question for you is that uh, how do you convince your patients to fistula? Because I know the nature of, the, of our, our, our people, so all the Egyptians, there is resistance to fistula. So how can you convince your patient to reach this score that is exceeding uh, many countries in Europe and the USA? Uh, I think convincing, this is a very good question. Uh, and the convincing patient to do this feeling is not one time show. It has to be a teamwork. Uh, we, I don't rely on myself when I'm talking to patients. Only. I ask them to have some support my parents, my social worker, to go together and sit with the patient, and if possible, with family. Some people move it towards the patient as well. And then we sit close to the patient and explain to them how bad the conditions and how bad this be, the results of that, and how the, the fiscal is quite important for him or her. On long term, long run, that's in that the case that there is no chance of PD or transplantation. And then if the only choice is chemo diaphragm, then because we have no choice, this is the best available for you. If you go the other direction, it's full of problems. For you, for us, for everyone. So we sit and explain the patient all these details, and most of the time, if possible, and if the time allows, we take the patient also to show other patients in the dialysis unit, and that's what we normally do with patients um, in the pre-dialysis clinic before they leave the state disease. We take them to the tour, show them the recovery dialysis section. They need some patients, and show them the catheter how it's done, and they take the catheter and show them the hemodiasis, how the procedure is done, what's this, this is the machine, this is the filter of the analyzer, these are the tubes. And we just orient the patients what they are going to do. I think this is very, very important for patients in the pre-dialysis stage because otherwise patients will go in shock once they put immediately stuck with the system. Or maybe not just the catheter, from a taken to a machine, they will be really in shock and they will become so nervous they can, uh, I mean, uh, become a violent for nurses, for doctors, for themselves, their families, they may shout, they might hit, they might do anything really. And above all, they may not be non-compliant patients, they don't stick to the dialysis. So, uh, convincing about the fistula performance, it is really the role of the team one, more than one person. Very important to approach patients from different aspects to convince them of the value of the aspect. Thank you very much for this excellent talk. I would say, since it is a common uh, problem that we face uh, in our life, sometimes you will say, from well, this doctor, and this doctor can't help us. My, my opinion, this doctor should be done by experienced vascular surgeon. Yeah, the vascular surgeon will be the blood of the shadow. And the first doctor will have a quite a number of options. There is a first doctor. أنا تبغى إن ما أعتقد يجي من هاي الفريد بصر شرير بدور دارم بصر سجن
لك ان الناس بضميرها في صفعة بتحس ان احنا جاهز فقبل ما تقول انا عايزك تعمل تيست انا بقول له شوف طالما انك انت كلينيكال كويس مش مهم قدامك كريتينين انا يهمني انك شهيتك كويسه بتاكل كويس مفيش تيشن جدا كويس مش هقول لك اس فلازم تحط الستيتمنت دي انك مش هتقول اس وبعد كده بتقول له بس في احتمال نعوز نسيب فاحنا محتاجين نعمل انفست لكن بس خد بالك مش معناه انك هتحس في النهارده ولا بعد شهر ولا بعد سنه انا مجرد بس احتياطا عايز اتعمل دي بتبقى الجزء الثاني الجزء الثالث تقول له يمكن تعوز تقول لي ان عاوز اعملها فبقول له لا ده انت عشان تستخدمها مش اقل شهر او شهرين فلازم تبقى موجوده عندنا فمع ان احنا مش هنعوزها النهارده ولا بكره ولا بعد ست شهور بس عايزين طيب اذا ما عندهاش ما سمعتش الكلام والزنان عاوزنا نسيب ما اضطر فلازم افهمه اللي يخوفه هنضطر نحط سايكليبيان ومشاكلها فانت اعمل فيستر وما تخافش ده مش معناه انك هتفسد ده ممكن تفسد بعد ست شهور بعد سنه بعد سنتين انما لازم تعملها انا اقصد لازم يكون في دايلوج بينك وبين العيان ومضطر انك تروح تعمل فيستر ممكن تخرجه وما تخرجوش ده مش هتبصص في عينيه وحاسس بالاكشن بتاعه فهي تبقى انك انت الاكتنيشن لازم تحس العيان من الانترفيو معاه ممكن تقولها له مش النهارده ممكن بكره بعده واثبت ازهاله تفهمه ان دي مش معناها ان هو هيفسد وتفهمه البلاغي المهمة اللي هو استنى لاخر لحظه عشان يعمل يعني ده تصوري شكرا دكتور محمد على فيست ده ايكوال ايكوال لايف ولازم احنا حاطين كده على فيست ديشن فور ديشن ستيب ثانك يو دكتور ايمن فور ذيس اكسلنت برزنتيشن وشوفوا في السبيكر ثانك يو فيري ماتش